Good morning, church family. Uh, welcome to Sunday morning service online. We're so glad you're able to join us for service here to, this morning. And uh, I just want to remind you that if you uh, want children's ministry resources, they're available on the website. We have videos for the kids. We have activity pages you can download and uh, get those ready for the kids as we get ready to worship here. Um, we also want to just encourage you guys to continue to share our page here, share the video. Uh, it's been so great to see so many people tuning in every Sunday uh, for the service. So uh, go ahead and share that if you get a chance. And with that, let's continue uh, our worship this morning as we pray, and uh, let's go before the Lord. Lord, we come before you. We just uh, thank you so much for who you are, for what you're doing, Lord. Um, just amazing things. <laughs> you always... Uh, working in amazing ways, Lord. We pray that you just fill us this morning with your spirit, Lord. Fill each home, uh, each person worshiping with us together, Lord. Uh, just draw us closer as a family and as uh, your children, Lord. We give you this time. In your name we pray. Amen.
church family. It is a good day to uh, worship together and of course we have some uh, great news. It is my joy to announce that next Sunday, May 31st, Calvary Chapel of Santee will reopen. Praise the Lord for in-person services and uh, I'm sure by now you've all heard the announcement by President Trump. Very grateful for our president uh, to declare what we already knew, that church is essential. And I love the way he uh, framed his, his comments, we need more praying, not less right now. I'm even grateful for Governor Newsom, who is cooperating with the voice of the people. And let me also, and I'm very grateful to those of you that have prayed, as well as the watchmen, uh, you know, watchmen meaning those that were on the wall that were doing battle as well, Thank you to all of you who emailed the government, those of you that stood in protest, all the believers in government, and certainly the pastors across California and our nation who played a role in making that announcement yesterday. So here's the deal. Next Sunday, we're going to reopen, and it is a fitting day for us to gather together. It's Pentecost Sunday, where we are going to be gathering to celebrate the day the early church was born. And so we're going to celebrate the rebirth of the ministry, at least in person here, uh, in our own church. So lots to get ready. Uh, the church uh, and the buildings need to be sanitized, which we're going to do that all next week. We need to get our, organized, uh, our volunteers organized. On Monday, we're supposed to receive from the government uh, the CDC guidelines. And so for a short period of time, the services are going to be a little bit different temporarily. Our goal certainly is to keep people safe as they come to gather at church and all that. And we're going to go the extra mile. It's a small thing, temporary inconvenience, no big deal in the big picture uh, to embrace and cooperate with what they ask us to do. Now, we're going to continue to, co uh, to uh, stream our services on YouTube uh, to the larger audience that's been tuning in the last few months. 
And those of you that may have health issues or uncomfortable to come to church or unable to come for whatever reason, we'll continue to stream our services and take care of you as it were. Uh, on Wednesday, though, we'll announce all the service times and all the necessary information, what meetings are going to be restarting and get going again. Uh, but the good news is we are going to reopen, and buddy, I am ready, let me say. And there's nothing like this place, I mean, for us anyway. I mean, it's not the sanctuary of God in the sense that one that will ultimately be on earth when Christ returns, but for us, it's our little home on earth, and there is no place on earth like this place for us. I love the psalmist in Psalm 73 when he said he was troubled about the weakness and uh, the wickedness that was going on in the world, and he was ready to give, it, give up and throw in the towel, and then he said, until I came in the sanctuary, and then I understood. Jesus, remember, made that promise where two or three are gathered uh, together, there he is in the midst, and nothing Nothing can replace the presence of God as the people of God meet together to worship and to share fellowship. So we're going to be opening next week, so be aware, make sure you tune in, and so that you're fully informed. So uh, reopening means everything's going to change. Uh, we're getting ready to start uh, home groups, and uh, so they're going to be changing and adjusting in light of the, uh, uh, the announcement to reopen. I want you to know, though, that Monday we're going to have the church office closed in observance of Memorial Day, so there'll be nobody here on Monday. All the other meetings that are scheduled to begin on Zoom are going to be in flux now. Again, make sure you tune in on Wednesday for our updates on our website. We'll share a video of what's going to happen immediately, and then we'll need to remain flexible as uh, more information comes out from the government and all that. And then we apply it to our specific situation here. But we're about uh, to gather together again. Praise the Lord. Now, a quick reminder again, if you'd like to, uh, you know, bring your tithes and offerings by the church or mail them in or or avail it uh, by giving online, we want to stop and take a moment before we continue to pray as we give back to the Lord. So why don't you join me in prayer now? Father, we do thank you for the good news uh, thank you for uh, your, your sovereign care uh, for the believers here, not only in California, but across the nation. We pray your blessings on our president and the decision makers, Lord, that they would continue to sense your presence and that you'd guide them as we uh, re-engage in ministry. And then, Lord, here at Calvary Chapel, we ask that you help us too, Lord. Lots of things to adjust, lots of things to restart, and so we pray for your leading and guiding there. And then this morning, Lord, as we give back a portion of what you've given to us, please guide and bless uh, this offering, Lord, that it might go to the furthering of your kingdom. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time of worship together today. Bless the remainder of our service, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And this is a song just to show our gratefulness of the many who serve in the military and, um, and those that have gone on before us. Holding the truth, led by the light, protecting the weak, and ready to fight. Spiritual war over men's hearts, evil the good, the light and the dark. So if I doubt, steady my faith, help me resist the temptation to hate. Head on the mark, if I fail to win, help me to stand with courage. Trust in the truth led by the light. Holding the truth led by the light, protecting the weak and ready to fight the spirit. 
Father, we thank you for our time together as a family, and Lord, we look forward to the teaching of the word. We pray that you would use Pastor Gary as he brings the word to us today, and it's in Jesus' name we ask, amen. All right, if you've got your Bibles handy, you want to go ahead and open them to Revelation chapter 22, and we are almost done with the book of Revelation. I figure we've got at least uh, only two more studies together. And as we turn to the Word this morning, before we do that, we want to pray. This is certainly a Memorial Day weekend where we remember and honor those who died in the military service on behalf of our country. And so it's always good, I think, to remember our real heroes. And uh, too often our culture worships celebrities that don't deserve uh, our uh, attention and all that. So those who have served, those who have been selfless, those who have laid their lives down so that we can remain free, they deserve our attention and our honor and for the most part you know Memorial Day weekend is a time where we spend together celebrating and having fun but let's also remember there are families that are still grieving over those that they have lost in military service so it can be a tough day for them so we want to make sure and pray for them I'd like to add though uh, since this last season let's add a few more heroes to our prayer this morning the medical people the nurses and doctors and, and folks that uh, served on the front lines of this virus uh, who put their lives at risk, they're heroes as well. And then we definitely want to pray for those who lost family to the coronavirus here. A lot of political noise and all that, but there are some broken hearts this morning that we want to definitely lift up. So let's pray together as we begin our study. Father, we do thank you for this morning and uh, thank you that we live in a country, Lord, where worshiping you is our right. It's built into the fabric of not only our, our system of justice, but the fabric of our Constitution, Lord. And so this morning, we worship you, we love you, we respond to you, and we want to lift up those on this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we want to express our gratitude for those who have gone before us, Lord, who have stood in difficult times and circumstances and laid their lives down. We realize, Lord, that freedom is expensive. It's cost blood. It's cost people's lives, Lord. And there are family members this morning uh, who have had people, had family members who have uh, lost their lives, Lord, in the service of our country. Please minister to them and give them your comfort in this time. And then we thank you, too, for other heroes, Lord, for the medical personnel who have been at the front lines of this disease and this season, Lord. Uh, bless and rejuvenate and reward them for their hard work and their tireless service. And then again, for families who have lost loved ones to this disease. Lord, we commit this weekend into your hands. We pray that we could be not only a God-honoring, but a patriotic uh, uh, citizenry, Lord, where we look to you, Lord, not only for our comfort and our strength, but also honor those who have made this great country possible. Speak to us, we pray now, as we open up your word 
uh, continue to minister your truth into our hearts, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me just say I am very excited to begin this new season of ministry. Uh, I think God has great plans uh, ahead of us. I mean, he's done some incredible things during this uh, virus season. I have to admit, though, the quarantine has been tough. It's been discouraging, and I'm guilty of two things. One, of overdosing on the news. You know, I, I, overdosing on too much information. It's fed my fears and lots of wrong information out there. A lot of this was overblown. Let me just say, I never got sick physically, but I am sick of the media. I'm going to go on a media fast, I think, for a couple of weeks. So I'm, I'm guilty of overdosing. I'm also guilty of overeating. I need to social distance myself from my refrigerator so I can flatten my own curves if you get my drift, you know. In fact, I got on the scale this morning, and we have one of those electronic ones, and uh, I got on it, and it said, please practice social distancing only one person at a time. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, I'm still damaged. I, if I can't hear you guys laughing, I don't know that I'm ever going to recover from this. But uh, anyway, I'll tell you, one, season, uh, one lesson I've learned from this season is how much I need my church family, how essential it is that you and I gather together. We were created for fellowship with God and for fellowship with one another. I think too often many take that for granted, have a tough time finding their way to church even when things are easy. But now that we've been apart for these couple of months, I hunger, I, I deeply desire to be together worshiping with God's people. All right, now we pick up in our study of Revelation, and now chapter 22, the last two chapters of Revelation, John's been describing the eternal state. So after our present world is gone, after the rapture and the tribulation, after the second coming of Christ, after the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ, after the judgment of the lost, in chapter 21, verse 10, we're told that John was taken to a vantage point to see the eternal city made of diamonds and jewels and brilliant colors. The glory of God, we're told, radiates and illuminates out into that new heaven and new earth. It's paradise. That's exactly what it is. And so now we see the story of man goes full circle. What began in a garden where paradise was lost because of sin, now through the work of Christ and his death on the cross and resurrection and his return in heaven, now all of that is restored. Heard a true story about a man named William Dyke who went blind at age 10. Very intelligent man, went through school, graduate school, and graduated college, but in college met the daughter of an admiral, and they fell in love and then made plans to marry. The week, though, before their wedding, he went through a medical procedure in attempting to restore his sight. Now, there was no guarantee that it would work, but the, he had the procedure, but wanted to wait until wedding day to find out if it was successful. So as the bride came down the aisle, literally they unwrapped the gauze from his eyes, and William's first sight was his bride's face. And he said on that moment, you're more beautiful than I ever imagined. Well, that's exactly what John said in chapter 21, verse 2. When he got his first glimpse of the new Jerusalem, he said, it's like a bride adorned for her husband. He said it was like going to a wedding, and the bride appears at the back of the room, and all eyes turn, and she takes everyone's breath away. Now, as I read these two chapters, let me say they're amazing, but they're frustrating. There's not enough information here for me. It leaves me wanting more, but there's enough here to, to uh, make sure in my own heart that I want to go there for sure to set my heart upon and to give me something to compare this world uh, to. So let's begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 22 where John continues, and he says, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So verse 1 begins with the word and. So that tells us that John is continuing to 
describe the new Jerusalem. And now we're taken from the mountaintop, this vantage point. Now John zooms in through that 216-foot uh, thick diamond wall, and now we get a view of the center of the city. Now, honestly, let me say, the, the previous chapter sort of seemed a little bit sterile. It described a large cubed city, walls of jewels and bright light, not all that warm if you get my drift. In fact, my wife said, isn't there any furniture in this city? I mean, come on, you know, uh, maybe a few plants around would help and, and, uh, and make it feel a little more homey. Well, that's what we're going to see now. The center of the city we find is the throne of God. I put in my notes, Dad's chair. That means something to me. And the city is filled with trees and river and, and a main golden street. I think it's probably uh, labeled Hallelujah Boulevard. And now we get a view of some of the accessories of the new city. Now, take note of several things here in just a couple of verses. First of all, John says there's a river of water of life coming out of the throne of God. So I, my imagination runs here. I see a gushing, flowing river coming out of the throne. Now, it says it's clear as crystal, so this must be heaven. There are no tires or cans in this river. There's no trash or mercury or pollution in this river. You, you must be in heaven at this point. But I love it. Here's God's idea of heaven and paradise. It's a garden city with a river. In fact, the, the name paradise uh, in its original language means enclosed garden. And Eden literally means delightful or delights. And ironically, when you study the Garden of Eden, we're told in the book of Genesis that probably it was on a mountaintop because it describes four rivers that had their origin there that split off and then pounded and poured out of that city. I don't know about you, but I've always loved the sound of waterfalls. And I just staggers the imagination to think about what was true in Eden and what was true here in heaven. You wonder if this is going to be restored as exactly like the original Eden where the waters from this throne are spilling out of the throne down onto the earth. Interesting, too, uh, God loves waterfalls. In Ezekiel 47, when uh, he describes the millennial reign of Christ, that thousand years after he returns, when Christ sits as king on the earth, it says the river flows out of the throne there in Jerusalem, out of the threshold of the temple, as it said. It begins like a trickle, it says. Then it gets a little deeper up to the ankles, a little more, a little deeper uh, up to the knees and then the waist. And then finally, it describes those that would need to swim in it. It goes over their heads. And it says everywhere that river went, it heals the earth. And remember, when Christ returns, the world have, will have gone through the tribulation. It will be burnt and judged and ruined. And so as this river flows out of the throne of God in the millennium, everything it touches, it heals, and everything blossoms and becomes beautiful again. Sort of reminds you of that scene in The Wizard of Oz when you go from black and white to color. Well, here it says it's a river of the water of life. Now, that's hard to describe, actually. The Greek words don't really help much. It just says it's, it's, it resembles water is kind of the idea, but we're lacking information here. Is this water wet? Will this water be in a riverbed? We're not told, really. It flows down the middle of the street. One man uh, calls it liquid life. I like that description. Uh, Jesus mentions, I think, uh, some of this in John 7, 37. He said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. Now, I think about that. You and I, when we receive Christ as our Savior, the Spirit of God came into our hearts and satisfied our hearts. But that wasn't wet. That was liquid life, if you will, as it came into our hearts and washed us clean and satisfied our souls. So here is a river of liquid life. Can you dangle your feet in it? I bet if you can, it'll be feel, feel pretty good. And I guarantee you, when you drink from this river, it's going to be like a York peppermint patty. Ah, you know, how that refreshes and invigorates. Notice, secondly, not just the river of the water of life, but also the tree of life is now in this city. So that was also from the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3.24, we're told that when sin entered the world and Adam and Eve rebelled against God, they were driven 
from the Garden of Eden, and God put a cherubim with a flaming sword to guard the way back to the tree of life that they would eat in their fallen state and, and become eternal, evidently. In that, and then there are a lot of questions there in my mind. But interesting, it does sort of indicate that probably what this is saying is that Jesus then, in order to accomplish salvation, went back into Eden, if you will, at least symbolically, and he was, you know, uh, died by means of the sword. He is, you know, his side was pierced by a, a spear, and so he suffered the consequences of what happened in the Garden of Eden, and now here in heaven, it's all restored. So the tree of life once again appears in heaven. And there's a too, the language here is all in the singular. It's the tree of life, singular. So it's either one kind of tree, as it, uh, in my mind, lines the, each side of that river of the water of life, or it's one big tree that sort of overshadows in a big way the city and the street that comes at or around the throne. By the way, there's a little bit of precedence for this. I put the picture up on the screen there. It may be like the aspen trees. Aspen trees are actually the largest organism in North America. They grow not so much from seeds, but from shoots or from daughter plants. That The whole aspen uh, forest or grove, if you will, is joined at the roots. It's literally one tree with many trunks. So maybe it's like that in heaven. Maybe the tree of life is, is underneath. And again, who knows if there's dirt in heaven? I don't, for some reason, I don't think there is dirt in this city. But in either, in either case, this one is lining the, uh, the, 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 the river of life and, and bringing its life-giving properties to uh, the population that lives there. Somehow, like the water of life, it's going to satisfy and enhance our life there. And one man said, way better than a protein shake or a nitro cold brew from Starbucks. It's going to be that good. Notice also, it says the source of life is that which comes from the throne. So the water, the life of heaven has a source and it can't, comes from the throne of God. The place of authority, place of power. And I, I point that out because it's, it, what it's reminding us is it's not a human source. It's not because of human effort. It's not because of the human spirit. You hear that a lot. But life in this realm comes from that realm being submitted to the throne. And by the way, that's still true. Uh, those who are not saved, who have, ne who have never really surrendered their life to the Lord, you're never really going to know the abundant life. You're never going to really totally understand what life's all about. In fact, the proverb says, the way of the sinner is hard, and it is. And it's a searching question that everybody has to answer. Who's in charge of my life? It's been said that the throne that you bow to is the, what determines the direction of your life. I think that's true. If you're bowed to a worldly throne or you're bowing to worldly things, it's going to determine the course of your life and you're going to end up uh, reaping all kinds of trouble and emptiness and poison. Well, in one sense, you could say what makes heaven heaven is it's not just because human beings are finally fixed or human beings are finally better. It's because this entire realm is submitted to and surrendered to God. That's why it's heaven. And by the way, that, again, that, 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 that spills over into every area of our life. That's, what, that's one of the keys to marriage. Paul said in Ephesians 5.21 that husbands and wives should be submitted to one another. And for many uh, husbands and wives, they discover once they're married, oh, man, we're so different. We see things so differently. How are we ever uh, going to agree on anything? Well, here's how. You both submit to the Lord and submit to one another, and out of that comes harmony and compatibility. But what it's telling us here is that submission to the throne is the real source of life. And there are a lot of people that are afraid to submit their lives to the Lord or surrender their lives to Him. They're afraid, even as believers, to let go and to let God. But the truth is, reality is, when you're surrendered to that throne, that's when life truly begins. Now take note, it says also in verse 2 that the trees that are mentioned here, or the tree, bears 12 kinds of fruits. So a pretty unusual tree here. And by the way, what kind of fruit is it? In my opinion, the top 12 fruits of all time. In my opinion, there's definitely going to be some mangoes on these, on these trees. Now in Eden, again, uh, you, you see glimmers of this. Remember when God was cre creating the heavens and the earth, 
the first time. It was on the third day, we're told, that God created the fruit trees. And by the way, when he did, there was nobody there to eat them. Man wasn't made or Adam wasn't made until the sixth day. So you have to understand, as God's making the trees and the fruit and all that, he's going, wait until Adam gets a taste of one of these. And then we're told that Adam and God walked in the cool of the day. I can see the, the Lord going, here, try one of these and taste one of these and all that. Well, wait until you taste the fruit from one of these trees in heaven. Now, again, this brings up the issue, the subject of why is there food in heaven? I mean, our new bodies are different. They're eternal. Uh, yes, we're tangible. Yes, we have identity. But why do we need food? Why is the food? Why is there fruit in heaven? Well, evidently, and the Bible bears this out, uh, that eternal beings do eat. In fact, in Genesis chapter 18, we have a good example of Abraham was met by a couple of angels before they were going to go and bring God's judgment on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham made a meal for them, and the angels shared a meal with Abraham and his family. So eternal beings eat. Jesus, you remember, after his resurrection, appeared in that upper room with the disciples again, and there he ate fish and honeycomb. So again, it's not to sustain life. We won't need food to live in heaven. So the, really the only reason is for pure enjoyment. But let me also add this. I think we're going to eat in heaven because of fellowship. All through the Bible you see this. The Jews, when they shared a meal, there was something special that happened. Sharing a meal, you sharing the same food, your bodies being sustained physically by the same things, there was a oneness and a closeness that happened when you shared a meal. It's why the Jews wouldn't eat with Gentiles, because they didn't want to become one, as it were, with a Gentile. Well, in heaven, I think that's why we're going to eat as well. It will be one of the ways we continue to express our oneness together as we share in the delights and eternity together. In fact, Jesus in, Ma in Revelation 3.20, one of the promises he made to the church of Laodicea, uh, to those that were outside, he said, I stand at the door and knock. And he said, if any man open the door, I will come in. And his promise is, we will dine together. So here in eternity, not only is that a picture of salvation, but it's also a picture of eternal fellowship. And then verse 2 adds this comment. It says, they're going to bear fruit every month. So there again, we're, we're uh, reminded about a time word in heaven. And again, many I've heard that there's no time in heaven, we're in the eternal realm, and there's no night in the city, it says here, so how would you mark days and nights anyway and all that? And we discussed some of that a couple of weeks ago. Evidently, there's a different way to measure time. Will there be clocks in heaven? Yeah, I hope not. That would be a bummer if it was, but if there is, it will be different. You know, here in this world, time frustrates us. There's never enough time, it seems like. If you've got kids or if they're always in sports or activities or you're working on projects, we always feel pressed by times, by time and harassed by it. We're a slave, as it were, to our schedules, and we always feel like we're running out of time. Well, evidently, in heaven, time is going to exist in some form. We're going to mark months, it says that here, but we'll be able to live with time without the pressure. Somehow will help us manage our lives there without making us a slave to it. On earth, by the way, uh, the way you spend your time displays what's important or priority to you. How and where you spend your time says what really matters. People often say, well, I can't, I can't find the time. That's not true. You know exactly where all of your time is. It's not like you've lost it or anything. It's what's important that determines how you spend it. I found these sad statistics this last week. The average dad in America spends about 38 seconds a day in meaningful face-to-face -face friendship with his kids. It said in this, uh, also the survey that the average Christian uh, admits that they pray and read the Bible about one time a week, really, with any kind of uh, commitment to it. So it just, you know, it just, it's, you know, what you do with your time displays what's really important. By the way, here's another sad statistic. If the average age is 74, you only get 2,010 days on planet Earth. And if you're 40 years old today or thereabouts, you only have 12,410 more days before you reach that thing. So it just reminds us. Uh, life is short. Psalm 90, Moses said, Lord, 
Help me to number my days that I might gain a heart of wisdom. So there'll be time in heaven, but it will be different. Now take a look at the the last phrase of verse 2. It says, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now what an intriguing statement that is. Now last week, we we covered this and spoke about that there are going to be nations in heaven. There are going to be national distinctions. There's going to be cultural identity. Now we're going to have new bodies, but we're not going to be clones uh, we're not going to, there'll be that continued uh, racial uniqueness that we have in this world. In fact, in chapter 21, verse 1, uh, uh, John saw a new heaven and, uh, and new earth. So in some way, God is going to colonize and populate the earth. Now again, we're clear, uh, the residents of the city, the new Jerusalem, are the church believers and Israel, but there'll be many other saved nations and Gentiles that will live on the earth. And we're told in chapter 21, verse 26, that those nations will bring their honor and glory into the city there in eternity. So there'll be saved people from every people group, and they'll bring in the best of culture, the best of their nation, the best of the food, and the best of whatever their nation produces to honor the king. And again, everybody in this day, in this realm, is going to love God and love their neighbor. neighbor. There'll be no bigotry or racism or slavery or classes of people. We'll all still be different, but in heaven, compatible. We'll appreciate our differences and celebrate them, much like the church is today. We're one body with many parts. We're not all the same. We have different roles and gifts, but as we're submitted to Jesus and his throne, We're filled with the love of God, and we cooperate and complement each other perfectly. But here it says, the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. The healing of what? Why would they need to be healing? Chapter 21 says that there's no death, there's no pain, there's no curse, there's no death. Of what do we need to be healed of? Well, the Greek word here for healing is the word where we get our English word therapy. The word can be described or or, or actually rendered uh, helps or beautifies or enhances. Now, I don't think these leaves are medicine, like people are going to be grinding them up and putting them in their morning shake to feel better. Something about these leaves are going to emanate or radiate or enhance your ability to enjoy heaven. And by the way, this is not all that far-fetched either. I mean, today we have light therapy. And we have aromatherapy, we have sound therapy, and then they, you know, uh, scientists say that very often smells alone are connected to your memory. If you smell something familiar that brings up something from your childhood, you know, maybe grandma's cooking or whatever, you know, all that can connect with something and really bless you and, and, and enhance, you know, a, a, an experience for you. I think Solomon uh, hit it on the nail when he said, that laughter it works like a medicine. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I, I think as believers we should be laughing a lot because it's good medicine. Proverbs 15 verse 4 says, a wholesome tongue is like the tree of life. In other words, when you encourage somebody, you're enhancing and changing their life and even helping them with the direction of their life as you encourage them. Proverbs 13 verse 12 says, a desire fulfilled is like a tree of life. In other words, you know what that's like. A dream comes true or something you're able to accomplish. There's that deep sense of gratification and satisfaction. So in some way, these leaves as you uh, hang out under these trees are going to emanate and enhance something that will bring some kind of beautiful heavenly sound or smell or aroma or even light perhaps that, that will enhance your ability to enjoy heaven. Now, verse 3 continues on by saying this, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. A singular throne. The God and the the Lamb are the same God, if you will. And his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no light there in the city. They need no lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So, again, God's idea of paradise is listed here. No curse. Boy, is that ever good news. That's exactly what messed up our world. No sin. Nothing to drag us down. 
nothing to tempt us again. No disease, no death, no flus, no viruses, no cancer, no kids or adult suffering, if you will. No anger, no enemies, no war, no frustration. Nothing in that world will ever ruin things again. No darkness either, so nothing to fear. Nothing to, that will depress you. No dark part of the soul, soul, as some people talk about. No shadows in, this, in that world, no, whether real or emotional. Only the light and the glory of God. But there will be service. He said his servants are going to serve him in that eternal realm. And again, that reminds us that heaven is not going to be boring. We're not going to be floating on clouds and plucking harps and eating angel food cake. Or heaven's not going to be like a long church service that goes way too long. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 2 says that we're going to be ruling with Christ and even judging angels. In verse 5 of that chapter, it says we're going to rule and reign with Christ in his kingdom and evidently managing his universe and doing his bidding. And God is going to perfect our service. That's going to be wonderful. And, and one man put it this way, God is going to Uh, All of those frustrated desires that are in your heart are finally going to be fulfilled. Maybe you had the desire to be a great athlete, you know, I could have been a contender, or, you know, a great musician or artist or whatever. Well, finally in heaven, you'll be able to explore those things, and God will perfect our service for him in heaven. I love verse 4. God's idea of heaven, it says, is that we will see him face to face. Now, I understand this. I, I, I thought about this a lot this last week. I'm a father of four kids and the grandfather of 11 grandchildren. For me, the favorite time has always been dinner time around the table. And when we were raising our kids, I mean, life was crazy. I get it. Sports and school and all that. But every night, I wanted those faces at my table. I wanted to see their faces, I wanted to hear their voices. I wanted to talk to them. I wanted their undivided attention, even if it was just for a few moments and garbled because their mouths were always full of food. In fact, even Jesus, uh, you see that with the 12 disciples during his ministry. I imagine uh, the numerous nights sitting around the campfire at night with him, laughing together, talking about the events of the day. The Last Supper is exactly that. It's the Last Supper. It was a supper they enjoyed where Jesus said in Luke's gospel, I have eagerly desired to eat this meal with you and I won't eat it again until I eat it with you uh, in my kingdom. So God's idea of heaven is you and him at a table and have him say, so how was your day today? And you an unbroken fellowship with your heavenly father. Some cool things to think about. Now, verse 6 Then he said to me, the angel speaking to John, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of his holy prophet sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So the angel says these words are trustworthy and true. The words mean dependable and without fiction. And I'm glad that he says that, because sometimes when I read these verses, it seems like science fiction. He says, no, no, they're reliable, they're true, you can count on, this is actually going to happen. And he says here, uh, it reminds us, this whole book has been God sending his angel to John and uh, uh, revealing, along with the person of Christ, this whole revelation that we might know what's coming and and how it's all going to roll out. In fact, there have been lots of angels to this book uh, in a variety of roles. We've seen them involved in judgment. We've seen angels like tour guides as they show John around the city and what's happening on earth during the tribulation. They provided interesting information. They've answered some of John's questions. And here they add this one phrase. It says, these are the things that must shortly take place. In verse 7, it says, these things are going to come, or he's coming, is quickly. Now, whenever I read that, you know, it's, it's confusing. And a lot of people are confused by this statement. They say, well, they've been saying that for 2,000 years. And it's true. This book was recorded in 95 AD, and yet none of these things have actually come to pass yet. Well, the Greek phrase is really is a little more insightful. The words are in paxia, 
in the Greek, and it's where we get our English word tachometer. In other words, it doesn't mean it's going to come like right now. What it means is when it comes and when it starts and it gets revved up, as it were, it's going to come to a quick conclusion. You know, it's like getting in a car. You throw it in first, and you go to second and third and fourth, and you get up to speed. Once you put it in gear, you go through the gears, and it comes to a quick conclusion. That's what it's saying here. And by the way, we've been distracted uh, a lot lately because of the stay-at-home orders and focusing on flattening the curve of this virus. Um, it's time, maybe again, for us in a couple of weeks to have an update and all the things that were going on that we weren't paying attention to that are going on in the world, continuing to point us to the reality that Christ is indeed coming soon, and once it gets started, it will come to a quick conclusion. Well, in verse 8 it says this, Now I, John, saw and heard these things. That's an all-encompassing statement. From chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to chapter 22, verse 8, John says, I saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down uh, to worship before the foot or the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you don't do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. So at this point, John, he says, wow, I've seen it all. From chapter 1 all the way through the, the, the eternal city, I've seen the whole story of the book of Revelation. And John is overwhelmed, and so he just, though he knows better, uh, he knows this is wrong, he just drops to his knees, he feels compelled to worship somebody or something, and he begins to drop at the seat of this angel. And boy, you've got, what you've got here is a pretty smart angel. No doubt saw Lucifer fall and because he wanted to be worshipped and wanted to be exalted. And the angel goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. None of that, John. You worship God. Don't. I'm just one of the God's servants in his plan. And now I have to admit, as I look at these final verses, uh, poor John. I think we're kind of in a transition here. I think John is being transported back to earth on the Isle of Patmos. I mean, in chapter 4, he was caught up, as it were, uh, into heaven, and the book of Revelation unfolded before him, uh, but now he's back on the Isle of Patmos, which was a prison island. He's back into a 90-year-old body. That can't be any fun. So back in prison, back to the rock pile, probably feeling that now, wow, was that all a dream? What in that what, you know, world was that? And the guard probably yelled at him, hey, you know, what's wrong with you, daydreamer? Get back to breaking rocks. Get back to work. Man, this has got to be a real bummer for John. But yeah, I think we can relate to that in, in some ways. You know, boy, it'll be so good to get back to church. But even when you're worshiping in church and have had a great spiritual experience and you're really uplifted, Monday always comes. <laughs> and you've got to get back in traffic. And very often it feels like whatever I, I absorbed on the day before uh, sometimes fades a little bit when I get back into the grind of this world. Now look at the last command of this angel. He says to John to keep the words of this book. I like that. That's the same promise we saw in chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, Blessed is he who reads, blessed are those who hear, and blessed are those who keep the words that are written in this book. So here we are at the very end now. The angel says, John, keep. And the word means guard or cherish or don't lose your focus. Don't ever forget these words, John. Guard them into your heart. You know, it reminds me of 2 Kings chapter 21, where the Bible describes the, the history of the, of the king uh, named Hezekiah, one of the great kings in Israel's history, a man who was great, who loved the Lord, who was blessed, made a few mistakes, but it, it, to a large degree uh, was a really, really great king. He removed the idols from Israel. He restored the temple. He conquered many of Israel's enemies and was a great king, really in many ways on par with David. And the nation was blessed under his reign. But when he died, his son Manasseh took over. And Manasseh's name means forgetting. Wow. And that's certainly true. The, he, Manasseh led the nation into carnality and sin. And I find that's my struggle too. I forget. I'm so earthly-minded. I get so wrapped up in this world. I get so distracted, and I forget the important things, the eternal things. And that's often why 
uh, because we're not heavenly minded enough, we're not that earthly good at times. So here's the angel reminding us, don't lose sight. Don't forget to guard these words, the coming kingdom. Again, Paul said to set your affections on things above, not on the things of this earth. And I find this to be true. If you keep these things, the reality of heaven and the coming kingdom, I find it will keep you as well. It will keep you where you need to be. And let me just remind you, if you're going through a tough time right now, let me remind you, every storm, everything that you wrestle with in this world, every problem, every circumstance, every argument, every loved one you send ahead into the next world makes that place only sweeter to us. So the angel says, keep the words of this book, keep them close to your heart. Let's close in prayer together. Father, we do thank you for uh, the description that John gives us of that city. Again, it leaves us hungering for more, and yet, Lord, at the same time, enough to continue to show us how, how desperately we cannot wait to get there and how glorious it will be to finally be in our eternal home. Pray for all of us, Lord. Lots going on, lots swirling around us in this day and age with not only distractions, but our personal uh, tribulations and difficulties, Lord. Help us to keep these things in our hearts, Lord. Keep those things as precious to remember that we're only uh, strangers in this world. We're just foreigners. We're just here for a short time. We're here to serve. We're here to display the, the, the important things, the eternal things to our loved ones and our family. But heaven is our ultimate home, and what a home it will be. Lord, continue to keep us focused on that eternal place. Thank you for the record of your word, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord, you guys. Uh, enjoying these final two chapters of the book of Revelation. We have one more study uh, in this book, and so not sure that we're going to close it next week. Uh, it's going to be a very special morning as we reopen the church together and celebrate together. So probably a lot of worship next week and a shorter Bible study. No cheering now. Come on, no cheering. And, uh, and then we'll finish the book together and we'll move on to something else. Pray for me. I'm still on the bubble of where I'm going to go next. Uh, but anyway, have a blessed day in the Lord. I can actually say it and mean it now. I will see you next Sunday. Praise the Lord. Now, we've got some slides for you to enjoy. Go ahead, and, and this is the last time you're going to get to see these too, so enjoy your church family slides. See you next week. I worship you. I worship you.